Welcome everyone to our fourth and final session of Reading the Bible Rebelliously. Uh, we have been on this journey throughout the spring months uh, of taking a look at what, um, what the Bible, in particular uh, Old Testament, has to say to us today about issues related to liberation, redemption, justice, and um, Dave has been leading us brilliantly uh, through this exploration uh, of scripture. So welcome back. And um, Dave, I'm just going to turn it right over to you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I have to apologize for my mediocre camera. My normal laptop I discovered 15 minutes ago, the keyboard wasn't working, it was non-functioning. So I'm on my Chromebook. Um, but I hope that my sound is coming through OK. Like that's the important thing. Um, yeah, just speak. Just speak right up. It's a little. It's a little thin uh, to, to me. But maybe the others have their volume turned up more than I do. So, um, give me like a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Sort of. Sort of. A little bit louder. Could you use you a little bit louder? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> let me. How about this? Can you hear me better now? Better. Oh, so it's the headphones that are faulty. <laughs> um, funny. Um, all right, let me share my screen here. Do, do, do. Uh oh, now you're gone. But you're there, Egbert. Oh, good. <laughs> hey, Peggy. Oh. <laughs> what are you hiding in that cup? No, I've already had my vino for tonight. OK. <laughs> um, I'm, is my screen sharing? I don't think it is anymore. No. Nope. Zoom exited the moment I started to share my screen. So let's see if this works. There it is. It's there. Okay. Still there. Still there. Okay, cool. Because I can't see any of you uh, because I just have the one screen. So forgive me. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, just like unmute and uh, let me know. Um, so tonight is our final session. We're looking at the writings. Um, which is a weird, I'll introduce it in a moment. Um, but tonight we're gonna look at the book of Job and maybe the Song of Songs. There are more books um, that belong to this final section of the Bible than Job and the Song of Songs. These are my kind of uh, favorites because I think they're the weirdest books um, of the Bible. Um, but, Here's the game plan. Uh, after a brief prayer, I wanted to introduce the writings, uh, this final section of the Bible, of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, we're definitely going to do the book of Job, and then we can either have a group conversation, or we can do spend some time with the Song of Songs and erotic mysticism slash spirituality. Uh, so we'll do a group vote when that time comes after we do the book of Job. Uh, sound good? Absolutely. Cool. Um, so let us remember that we are in the holy presence of God. St. John Baptiste de La Salle, pray for, pray us. for us. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. Forever. All right. So tonight we're looking at the Ketuvim. Uh, the Hebrew word for to write is katav. And so the uh, pluralized noun of writing uh, or to write is Ketuvim. So the writings are the third and final section of the Hebrew Bible. Um, if you remember, I mentioned last session that 
in when Christians publish the Old Testament and the New Testament, we move the writings to the middle of the Hebrew Bible, um, of the Old Testament, uh, because we view the prophets or tended to view the prophets as predicting the coming of Jesus, which is simply inaccurate. Um, but the writings really are kind of like the final section of the Hebrew Bible. And when you think about the Hebrew Bible and its historical progression, you have the Torah, the first five books, the establishment of the covenant. Then you have the prophetic literature, which is the broken heart, um, which is about kind of uh, the events leading up to the Babylonian exile um, and then surviving the Babylonian exile and slavery. Um, and then you have the Ketuvim. And so the writings are a diverse collection of literature, um, both poetry and prose, that are about exploring what does it mean to live out the covenantal relationship with God. Now that we're back home, now that we're no longer in Babylonian slavery, how do we do this? Um, what's funky about the Ketuvim is that the books within it are not all that religious for the most part. Um, they tend to be relatively secular in nature. There might be mentions of God here and there, but overall, um, what I love about the writings is that they blur the distinction between, like, ostensibly what belongs to the sphere of the religious and what belongs to the sphere of the secular or the sacred and the profane. And so I tend to think of the Ketuvim because they were all written in over the course of about 500 years following the return from Babylonian slavery, they're kind of like um, a snapshot into what was happening in the mindset and heart set and spiritual life of ancient Israel once uh, the Hebrew people returned home and rebuilt their temple. And these tend to be the most philosophical of all the books um, because anybody who regardless of whether or not they believe in God, can pick up one of the books from the writings and engage it meaningfully. Um, so like the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, what does it mean to live a life well lived? Um, it's like, I've seen everything under the sun. I've seen, seen kingdom, kingdoms rise and fall. I've seen wealth be accumulated, but when somebody dies, they don't take anything with them. So what's the point of anything? You have Sirach and wisdom, like exploring, like what does it mean to be wise? What's the difference between like uh, book smarts and then wisdom? Uh, why is wisdom a virtue to be pursued? A number of the books, Esther, Song of Songs, Ruth, um, are focused on the importance and the primacy of human relationships. How do we love each other, both in friendship and in romance? and in filial bonds, as we see with Ruth. Um, a number of the books hit on like notions of fear. Um, what is worth fearing? What is worth being scared of in human existence? And on the other hand, what is worth our time and attention and our love? And then you have the book of Psalms, which was like basically the song book of the priesthood in the temple. Um, like, if you want to know what they were singing when they prayed in once they rebuilt the temple after the Babylonian exile, like the songs that Jesus heard, look at the book of Psalms. Um, and these are full of not only joyful songs, but most of the Psalms are of lament. Um, we kind of briefly talked about lamentation last time. Um, with the prophetic literature, because you have the lamentations of Jeremiah. Um, but most of the Psalms are about mourning and anger and frustration. There's like the one Psalm that's like, oh, I want to bash the skulls of my enemies' babies' heads against a wall. Um, some of it can be really quite brutal, but all of it is a lovely reminder of like what authentic prayer can be. Not that we should wish harm on infants, um, but sometimes expressions of such rage uh, are very much legitimate communication with um, God. 
But tonight, oh yeah, and then uh, why do people suffer? Like the book of Job, which is what we're focusing on tonight, why do bad things happen to good people? We touched on this last time with Deutero Isaiah, but uh, the book of Job is a weird, weird book. And that's what we're focusing on tonight. So the book of Job, um, basically uh, 1500, or sorry, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, there were a variety of cultures that had folk tales like Job. Sumerian, Egyptian, Babylonian cultures all had their own versions of the book of Job. Um, and essentially, all of these folk tales ask the same question. Why is it that good people suffer? Why do the gods permit good people to experience pain and tragedy? And so in short, in this book, uh, God allows Satan uh, to attack the most perfect man, this guy named Job. And Satan uh, strips Job of his property by natural disaster, kills his family, and then afflicts Job with acute physical suffering, infecting his body with some sort of festering skin condition. And I find Job so interesting because every other book of the Hebrew Bible almost um, kind of gives us the impression that if we follow the commandments, God will reward us with prosperity and wealth and good fortune. And this is kind of the message of modern evangelical Christianity in many circles. Not all of it, but a lot of it is this prosperity gospel that if you tithe money to the church and if you do good works, um, or sorry, no, and if you do good things in the religious sphere, then God will reward you with wealth and prosperity. But you and I and anyone with a conscience or any degree of self-awareness knows that like bad stuff happens to good people. And that really evil people can amass great wealth and prosperity. And when we look at like the American bipartisan politic, I think we see this play out in so many ways, right? right? That Donald Trump, I think in large part was elected because like evangelicals looked at him and they were like, oh, he's so wealthy. That means he must be blessed by God. Um, and so there are very important practical, economic, political, cultural implications for asserting that like God rewards those um, who follow the commandments, who are close to him. Does that make sense? Y'all see what I'm saying? Um, yes, it makes sense to me. Cool. Rock on. So the book of Job, because I can't see anything right now, the book of Job is the only book of the Hebrew Bible in its totality that actually goes against what everything else in the Hebrew Bible says. Um, it attacks the notion that following the commandments automatically results in reward. And this is really quite something. Um, because the book of Job is basically three sections, and the first and last are very short. In the first three chapters, God permits Satan to attack Job, and Job is not a Jew. He's not an Israelite. He's from the land of Uz, and scholars debate where that is. It's probably, um, modern-day Iraq or Iran, but the land of Uz isn't mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, so we don't really know where it is. And basically, Satan approaches God and is like, hey, God, I bet that I can get Job, the most perfect man, to curse you um, if you let me torture him, if you let me hurt his family, if you let me strip him of his property, and if you let me uh, harm him physically. And God's like, sure, go for it. And then, can I interject with a question? Yes, please do. Uh, I'm uh, absolutely puzzled on the uh, 
the conversation or whatever, the communication between God and Satan. I never thought that God would talk to Satan directly. I know. And that's exactly what we're going to look at. So hold on to that question, Egbert. I love it. Um, and so, yeah, God and Satan have this back and forth. And God's like, yeah, do whatever you want, but don't kill him. And throughout all the torture and pain that Job experiences, his house, his crops, his animals, his servants, his family being taken from him, the festering boils, he's literally scraping boils off of his flesh with a shard of pottery. Um, uh, but he never curses God. And then out of nowhere, for like um, like 30-something chapters, Job's four buddies show up, and they spend dozens of pages trying to tell him why God has let him suffer. Kind of like what we did last session, come up with all these reasons for why God allows innocent suffering. And Job's wife, who is named throughout the whole thing, her one line in the entire book, it's almost comical. Her one line is, you know what, Job, curse God and die. In the final four chapters, God appears out of nowhere and responds to Job. It's a very weird response. We're going to look at it in a little bit. And Job tells God, my bad. I'm sorry for asking why I have suffered. And then in the final eight verses, God gives Job everything back twofold. So in the first chapter, there are specific numbers given for how many donkeys and oxen and sheep Job has. In the final eight verses, God gives Job everything back twofold. Now, here's what I want you to know going into this before we get reading. Yeah. That those final eight verses were written in a much more modern form of Hebrew than the first 42 chapters and eight verses. What happened was um, somebody read the original story, which ended with God's speech to Job. <clears throat> and they're like, ugh. Like, this isn't good. We need a happy ending. <laughs> and so some random author uh, added on a happy ending to Job, where God gives Job everything back. So I, I just want you to know that whoever originally wrote this story did not finish it with a happy ending. Mm. Um, that said... Uh, this is our typical image of the devil. <laughs> this is from the 13th century. Uh, uh, the image on the left is uh, a, a page from the Codex Giga, which is the most complete, oldest illuminated manuscript uh, written in, I believe, the Czech Republic. Um, and it's called the Devil's Bible because it's got this full page picture of the devil. The whole Bible is like 38 inches tall. It is massive. Um, but this is our typical image of Satan. And so what I want you to question, as we read the first three chapters, which are only two pages, like, firstly, who is Satan? Um, what's he doing? Why is he talking to God? And secondly, I want you to ask yourselves, why is God a jerk? Because when you read the story, God is undoubtedly kind of a jerk. Um, like, let's not pull our punches here. God is being a jerk in the book of Job. So as we read this, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to drop the, um, the Google Doc with the readings in the chat. Mm -hmm. So in the chat, you should have the reading. Um, Now, we have a couple options. I can read this out loud, which I'm happy to do, mm -hmm. or people can read it on their own um, in I, silence. I, I'd say read it out loud and loud, and we can read with you. That really works the best. OK. Mm -hmm. Any dissenters before I do that? Good. OK. 
Um, okay, so we are scrolling down to page five in the Google Doc, the Book of Job. So here's chapters one through three. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold feasts in one another's houses in turn, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the feast days had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This is what Job always did. Here's my commentary on that. Notice, Job is so good that he's even offering sacrifice for his kids in case they mess up. He's covering <laughs> all of his bases, right? And the text says that he's the greatest man in the East, right? So he's not in Israel, he's in Uz, but he's the best dude in the East. Mm -hmm. So back to the text. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, all that he has is in your power. Only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house, right? So the sons and daughters are party animals. A messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them and the Sabians fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came across the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or char charge God with wrongdoing. More of Dave's commentary. I read it this way because I think that this was originally kind of a campfire tale. It's kind of a, a dramatic, kind of tragically comic story, right? The servants come in one after the other while the previous one is still talking to tell Job everything has fallen to shit. Like your servants are dead, your animals are stolen, things are burning down and a house fell on your kids. Mm -hmm. Like it's meant to be like this high energy kind of thing. Okay. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There was no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man 
who fears God and turns away from evil. Get this, Satan. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have, they will give to save their lives, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Which is to say that Job is scraping like uh, gross pustules and things off of his flesh and burning them to get rid of the disease and he's sitting in the ashes. Oh. Yeah, Ooh, gross. So sure. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and, in, oh, sorry, I said that. Then his wife said to him, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, somewhat misogynistically, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all of these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. All right, now we get ready for some of the most beautiful poetry outside of the prophets. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, let the day perish in which I was born in the night that said a man child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it or light shine on it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick, thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Yet, yes, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry be heard in it. Let those cursed who curse the sea, those who are skilled to rouse up Leviathan, let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. May it not see the eyelids of the morning because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb and hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb and expire? Why were there knees to receive me or breasts for me to suck? Now I would be lying down and quiet. I would be asleep. Then I would be at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuild ruins for themselves or with princes who have gold, who fill their houses with silver. Or why was I not buried like a stillborn child? like an infant that never sees the light. There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They do not hear the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slaves are free from their masters. Why is light given to one in misery and life to the bitter in soul, who long for death but it does not come, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly, and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to one who cannot see the way whom God has fenced in? For my sighing comes like my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. Truly the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes." I want to note, before we get into discussion, that what Job is doing, this is a very carefully crafted prayer. This is essentially the seven days of creation laid out, and then Job recalling for them to be rewound in space and time. 
And he is essentially calling for the entirety of creation to be brought in on itself. But he does not curse God. And so with that, let me type in the chat the two questions I've got. First of all, who's the Satan dude? And secondly, why is God a jerk? And go, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Why would uh, God even engage Satan in pulling some stuff on Job? God, God could have done it himself. Why even bring in Satan in? It's true. Right. And I, just to comment on that briefly, um, the Satan uh, tells God, you know, cast your hand upon him. Right. So this is clearly, I mean, the Satan is the medium, but God is the one doing the, the torturing here. Kind of reminds me of the temple, uh, the temptation of Christ early in his journey by Satan. The three, you know, the parallel that I see is uh, Satan tempts Jesus to fall down and worship him. Is, is Satan our inner desire to escape suffering? Oh, man, we're getting Jungy in here. <laughs> <laughs> is Satan self-doubt? Or, or lack of hope? Or, mm -hmm. or a sense of despair? Mm -hmm. Then what does that make God? Jerk. <laughs> uh, for offers, you know, as human beings, we have choices, you know. I see that as a test, not necessarily a jerk. <laughs> but Job has chosen all the right things, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Like he is blameless. Like that's as close as the Bible gets to like saying he is Jesus. Or anyone that's not Jesus is Jesus. Like he is blameless. Well, so all the people, so many people that suffer in this world are blameless, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right. Well, look, look at all the people in Ukraine. They're blameless. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Why? Why? Uh, can I think, and we touched on it uh, uh, before too. Why does God let that happen? Why the suffering? Well, what, what, what's behind this? Uh, uh, you know, we had in the reading where uh, the Israelites went uh, through the waters, and uh, 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 God parted the sea, and then the enemy he he destroyed. So why does he do it there? Why doesn't he do it to the Russians? <laughs> well, and, and God knows all things past, present, and future. So it's kind of like gambling. When you already know what card it is, it's going to come up. He already knows the choice that Job is going to make. I have a 20-year-old grandson who says he could never believe in God because why would so many bad things happen to good people, which is, I guess, the question that comes up all the time right yes mm -hmm. i think it has something to do with the fact that god gave humans free will and the story shows how um you know it's not a just or unjust thing that someone can be visited upon with everything the worst possible happen and how we respond to that or how we believe in it i guess is you know based on I guess what kind of uh, individual we are, but we have a free will to to you know say, oh God could fix this or God's responsible, or we can say the devil made me do it. I mean, there's all these things we have a response to, but I think the story just shows how how really unjust suffering is, and it could visit anybody 
for even an unknown reason. There doesn't have to be a rhyme or reason for it. Mm -hmm. Although the story is also about this individual Satan who I do believe that Satan roams the earth and causes havoc wherever he can get away with it. And even if we are a super prayerful and, and believing person, it can still happen to us. It's, it's just, you know, it's a hum, human condition of suffering, I guess. So what you're saying, we all could be a But joke. I believe Satan is behind a lot of the evil. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a, a question. Um, where else in the Old Testament does Satan show up? Garden of Eden. Yeah. I, don't I thought we covered this. The yeah. <laughs> right? Remember, the serpent is not the devil. Mm -hmm. Well, so... Uh, expound on that is he temptation i mean the garden of eden story never happened it's an it's an allegory of you know good and evil and choices that human beings have yeah it's it's a really uh, myth um but the serpent in ancient near eastern literature is a symbol of a number of things both wisdom and chaos he's kind of a trickster figure uh, and when you read the text the serpent is never described as evil. He's a trickster. And he doesn't tell Adam and Eve a lie, right? He tells them, eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you will become like gods, which is true. It's entirely true. But apart from, apart from Genesis, which I'm sure many disagree with, would, would disagree with that, where else is Satan mentioned in the Old Testament? Well, Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. Yeah, not, not Jesus. I'm talking Old Testament. Old Testament. Old Testament. Okay. There's angels. Oh, yeah. Boy, are there angels. They're definitely <laughs> So it doesn't have to do with the, the early part of the Bible where it talks about the angels' rebellion and those that were cast away from God are the ones that roamed the earth causing all this havoc. Tempting. Yes. That story about the fallen angels is actually nowhere in the Old Testament. Oh. It occurs in uh, two books called the Book of Enoch and the Book of the Watchers, which were and asking really old Jewish texts, but they are not in the Bible. And mm -hmm. it's funny that this mythology worked its way into kind of the Christian imagination because it's not in the Bible. It's oh, given, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's given mention in the book of Revelation. Um, oh. <laughs> and Jesus talks about it briefly, but the full story of that is not in the Bible. Mm. Mm. So who made it up? Right. Where is the other from? reference? Oh, man. Uh, well, let me, are there any other thoughts on those two questions? Who's Satan and why is God a jerk? And then I can, I'll continue. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I can't answer why he's a jerk, but at one point he sort of like picks on job, like he's making fun of him, sound like the words were like, he's being such a good guy. Isn't that? Ridiculous. I know. Yeah, yeah. Or, or um, he has such confidence in Job that the, Satan can throw anything at him, and mm. God believes in his goodness and that he will somehow be okay. That is such I'm a terrible reading, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> it's what? It's a charitable reading. <laughs> well. What do you think? Charitable. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, I think God, our Father, is merciful and compassionate, and He will forgive every sin at the end of time. 
And I don't know how he does that, but he's, he's promised that he will redeem us, save us. And, you know, how many times do we forgive those who have offended us? 70 times seven. So I see my God as merciful again and again. When I stumble for the 300th time, he takes me back and somehow makes all things new. That's a Pollyanna, you know, but I mean, I, I see that for myself. Well, I blame the whole thing on the guy who wrote this story. <laughs> <laughs> He's just trying to, trying to, I don't know, befuddle our belief, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I, have, I, I have a thought. Um, could it be that our true purpose isn't isn't here on earth it is um with god in heaven and no matter what happens here um our greater glory is with god in heaven um and so there's satan has no power over heaven um and 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 no no um devastation can keep us from that love of God um and maybe Job knows more than we know um that that gives him uh such um courage and and endurance to to bear all this grief um so does he know does he know his greater purpose um what what really is our purpose here on earth um what um what what is the purpose of life uh, and um what is our destiny um as as believers in god Old Testament God seems so different from New Testament God. I mean, Old Testament God was kind of angry and vengeful. And uh, I don't know. I just didn't Jesus come to change our our vision, our version, our, our the way we see God. I, mm -hmm. I think Jesus came to let us know who God is and have our relationship with him. Before that, we were making up all our own ideas, I think. But also that that has changed over the years with the way the church taught. You know, it wasn't until about uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago where we really were talking about the punishing God. And, you know, the, uh, the priests were preaching, why you sinners and all those things. And uh, uh, it, it has shifted now. We are talking more about the loving God. We are talking about the forgiving God. And that really has changed, uh, if I want to say, more in the last 20, 30 years. True. I want to I want to just make an, my two cents. I agree with Judy. I think it was Judy that said, um, God knows all things, or at least that's, you know, we're told to believe God knows all things. So I think here, God is the trickster. God is baiting Satan. He's like, I know Job, you know, I know what he's going to say. I know what he's going to do. And that's why I tell you, you cannot touch him. You cannot put one finger on Job. But I know what he's going to do. And so I think he's teasing Satan. Um, you know, and, and, and again, that same relationship to the 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus in the desert. You know, Satan is testing Jesus, but Jesus, Jesus isn't going to, to buy any of that. So, yeah, I, I think the story is twisted just to make us feel bad but i think that here god is god already knows what's going to happen but you know it really doesn't fit the image of god the image of god really doesn't uh uh show him as a trickster or as a goofball or whatever you know uh, it, it doesn't fit that, that that's why i have problems with the whole thing it doesn't fit his image right but but all these things were folk tales to begin with right yeah 
Okay, so that's that's where I'm coming from. That, yeah, that these were all all stories starting with Genesis. Um, you know, from way from you know two thousand years ago, four thousand years ago. So, um, it, that's my take on it. And, and like we learned in uh, in the previous session, that a lot of those things we have been reading uh really are not proved historically yes i don't know about a lot but some yeah some of them i think i think some things can be the, the more and the more the archaeologists are out there the more they're finding things that can be attributed to some of these stories that were in the bible Um, yeah, those are really great insights from everybody. Um, I want to preface what I'm about to offer with this. Um, more than studying any other book of the Bible, getting into Job, like, almost made me lose my faith in the whole Christianity thing. So <laughs> I want to preface what I'm about to offer with that because it is kind of a mind trip what we're about to get into um but i also want to offer based on what uh Marilee, uh said sorry if i'm mispronouncing your name um that jesus is the fullest revelation of who god is right and so we have as you all have mentioned these stories from the hebrew bible which were written over the span of like hundreds of years created over the span of hundreds and hundreds of years by so many different people and so we have to keep in mind that the hebrew bible is full of contradicting and divergent images of god um and job is there's no book that is more emblematic of that than the book of job but for any of us um who are catholic like the person of jesus is the face of god um so just go to jesus if any of this is um messing with your head too much that said um i'm giggling because i'm excited uh <laughs> uh All right. <laughs> what is that? Anybody a know? Gesture. <laughs> a jester, exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, Satan is not a proper name. The character of Hasitan in Hebrew is not the devil or Lucifer or Beelzebub or Baal or any sort of evil demon. This is hard to believe, and it's hard to believe because in the English language and in Christianity, we have in our heads that Satan equals the devil. Now, right. when, when Satan and Jesus go out into the desert and Satan tempts Jesus, that's the devil, no doubt. But in Hebrew, the word Satan means the accuser or the adversary. And when you read the text, it says the heavenly beings approached God and Hasatan went up to God and asked. And the Satan is an angel. The Satan is a good guy. It doesn't seem like that. But remember that we are dealing with really ancient literature. And so in really ancient literature, the court of heavenly beings, every angel has its own purpose. And so the role of the Satan is to question God, to um, pose an obstacle to God, because in really ancient religious literature, God is not perfect. And so God needs um, literally a devil's advocate, a, a counterbalance, a counterpressure. And so this is the origin of the medieval jester. The jester 
was like the smartest guy in the court, but had to dress like an asshole so that God would not chop his head off. Um, but the jester's role was to question the king or the queen, right? To make them pause and think. And so like we tend to think that the Satan in the book of Job is the devil because frankly of like crappy Bible translations and interpretation and education. Um, so that, my friends, is the bombshell of the evening, that the Satan in the book of Job is not the devil. It's actually a good guy. Hmm. Kind of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at Job chapters 38 to 42, which I'll read in a moment, not all of it, but I'll give you a portion. Um, So for 30 something chapters, Job and his friends have spent all this time being like, why did God allow us, Job, to suffer? Why did God kill Job's children? Why did God destroy his property and take his servants? And Job's friends are basically like, well, you must have messed up somehow, but forgotten about it. Or, um, oh man, what's another one? Like, Job, you're never going to understand God's ways because God is so much more powerful than you. You're a human. Just endure it and carry on. There are so many rationalizations they come up with. And then out of nowhere, God appears out of a storm. And God drones on. I shouldn't say drone because it's really quite beautiful poetry. God goes on for like four chapters, giving Job an answer. Job's friends disappear. So here's how it goes, chapter 38. Um, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and it is dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. And then I'll skip some to get to my favorite parts. Oh, so here's God talking about um, constellations of stars. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? The Pleiades, by the way, that's the constellation on the Subaru um, blue. Oh, is it? <laughs> icon, the Pleiades. So can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season, or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? And then, uh, ba, 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 oh, here's the best part. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? <laughs> Do you observe? having of the deer can you number the months that they fulfill and do you know the time when they give birth when they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of their young their young ones become strong they grow up in the open they go forth and do not return to them 
Who has let the wild ass go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift ass to which I have given the steppe for its home, the salt land for its dwelling place? It scorns the tumult of the city. It does not hear the shouts of the driver. It ranges the mountains as its pasture and it searches every green thing. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will it spend the night at your crib? Can you tie it in the furrow with ropes? Or will it harrow the valleys after you? Anyway, right? So God goes on for like four chapters of this. Like, I love that. Do you know when they give birth? Joe, do you? Do you know when they give Tell me, do you, do you control the stars, man? So what is God's answer to Job's suffering? What is God's answer to Job's suffering? Let me type that. Um... No, no, no. And I promise you, you are welcome to read through it yourself. That is all that goes on in the last four chapters. It is God asking Job questions about the natural world. The tone, though, is uh, from God to Job. Uh, who are you to ask? Your question is inconsequential, uh, in 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 light of of all of these miracles of nature that only I know about. Yeah, would the New Testament God have that tone? I don't know. Now, here's a question. Are there multiple tones that we can read this with? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, this is God emerging from a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. But what's at the center of a whirlwind? Why? I mean, I'm hyperbolizing a bit, but... Um, does God have to be screaming these questions angrily at Job, or can they be a gentle whisper? Mm. Mm. Could be more of a pleading tone, huh? interesting because still these words they they remind me of, of passages in what isaiah uh where the prophet declared <clears throat> the in in the words of god your ways are not my ways your thoughts are not my thoughts um to that to that um That's what comes to me here. Uh, I have a question. Um, if these stories aren't particularly true or real, they're, they're written by humans, does God's voice reflect the fear of God's people? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, the center of a storm is is the calm. And and would Job have listened to God if he had come in a whisper rather than this storm? You know, to say, I created everything. You have no control over anything. I'm the one who controls it. <clears throat> he didn't even give Satan the power to do anything to I mean. The adversary couldn't do anything to Job without God's permission. It allowed that to be. So I think of a storm. Um, you know, I have storms in my life, and and I have um, <clears throat> usually run away from them. But you know, 
I've found of late, you know, last several years or something, when I am really stuck and try and solve everything myself, I have learned, oh, I'm really, I'm really anxious about this. And I have turned it just, God, I don't know what to do. You know, that's kind of simplistic, but uh, help me. I, and when I really say that heartfelt, and I'm quiet, and then, you know, make the bed or whatever and go about and there, you know, thoughts start coming and, and um, I've just seen that that's the, the wisdom of God coming through and I need to, when the thought comes, to be quiet and look at it, not like uh, the racing brain, you know, throwing stuff out that maybe, um, maybe that's that quiet voice. And it causes me to think further. I don't know. And then the other thing I notice a lot is that I become not so agitated. Like I have to solve that, you know, it's like, hmm. Okay, that's that's interesting. I can't really explain that, but I see that as kind of the calm in the storm when you just say, ah, I don't know why this is happening. I don't see an answer here. Help me, help me. When I say that, ah, I need you in my life, I'm struggling. When that is heartfelt in me, there's a change in my thinking, a calmness, and just a comfort. Maybe it's just saying things out loud and then, you know, my psyche thinks, yeah, you, that's right, you're not in charge. And, uh, you know, you don't have to know all the answers. I don't know. But I, I think about that when, Judy, you talk about the calm in the middle of the storm, because I think, oh yeah, that's, mm -hmm. I need to listen. So would, so would the storm storm be Job's questions and answers is all of his questions and his upsetness and and God is the calm that that talks to him. I mean, you're seeing all the the storm is being what Job is experiencing, mm -hmm. and. Once you get through the storm, there's the calm where you get the answers, like Margaret said. Hmm. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I know that Dave uh, posed a question about how do we deal with suffering and all of that. And I just figure the older we get, the more suffering we've experienced. <laughs> and you kind of get to the point where you realize, I mean, that's life. It's valleys and mountains and sometimes just little plateaus in between and sometimes a long journey on a long road that doesn't seem to have much landscape to it. But um, for myself, I just... I just kind of expect tragedy. <laughs> I always expect there's something else coming along because if you live long enough, there's going to be something miserable. I mean, the loss, it's just a part of life as we get older that we're losing people we really like and care about. Or the, For me, this stupid war in Ukraine just really is like, a big pile of poop on top of all the crap we've had for the last seven or eight years. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why? <laughs> Stop. Can't somebody do something about that man over there in Russia? <laughs> but anyway, I just, I figured, you know, that the faith I have and the, and the community God's blessed me with the, for faith and, and uh, friendship and all this, I, I just feel that God gives us what we need. And some of us find ways to deal with suffering in better ways than others. And, and that 
the human condition is suffering and loss, but there's lots and lots of joy in, in it. And because of Jesus, we have this hope that sooner or later we'll be somewhere else in eternity. And that was what this journey on earth was all about, to spend eternity in, in God's presence and hopefully the presence of all the people we ever loved. I don't know. It's just that's how I, that's what keeps me from taking a knife to my own throat. <laughs> <laughs> There better be a reward somewhere. <laughs> um, so uh, whoops, one second here. Um, I tend to think of God's response as an invitation to wonder. Um, kind of what you two said beautifully. Um, It is a non-answer answer. There is no reason that God gives for why God has let Job suffer. Loss of property and loss of his family and his health. It is a mystery with a capital M. Kind of like we did with Isaiah last time. Like <clears throat> any theodicy, any rationalization we come up with for why God allows unspeakable things to happen is going to fail. Like it's just going to fail. Um, and what to summarize God, the more I read this, the, the less I'm inclined to read it as a, an angry God screaming at Job. I think it is more of a really, um, it's a soft invitation to like, look at everything that surrounds you. It's kind of an, an invitation to like, we're talking about a text that was written before the scientific revolution, but it's as close to like scientific exploration as it gets. Because God takes Job from like the cosmos and the stars, like the birthing patterns of gazelle. And God's like, just like, look at this stuff. Like, what, what is your role? And it's not the sort of thing, and granted, this is one person's reading, and it might be wildly inaccurate, but maybe it just helps me sleep at night. Um, <laughs> it is like, uh, not like God saying, like, look at how tiny you are, puny human, but it's like, look at all the amazing things that surround you. Like, contemplate it, behold it, contemplate it. And like, this is what I tell my freshmen, like, because teenagers are more depressed and suicidal now than they have been in decades. Like, stop looking at social media. Like, look, avert your gaze from your phone and look elsewhere. Um, because all of this, and this is not a bad thing, but all of it is going to turn to dust. Like, it is going to literally disintegrate. And like, you are too. And that's not a bad thing. And so when I look at, like, the, the person of Jesus and read through the, and pray with, like, the passion narrative 
Um, Jesus himself has no answer, right? He weeps in the garden. Um, his sweat becomes like drops of blood. And this is a medical condition called tomatidrosis, where like under extreme stress or anxiety, the capillaries at the surface of your skin, especially around mucous membranes, can burst and you can bleed out of your pores and cry blood. So like when Luke talks about Jesus, like his sweat becoming like drops of blood, that might not be a dramatization. That might be like Jesus freaking out. Um, but Jesus doesn't have an answer. Um, but for Christians, like the cross isn't an answer, right? It is a an invitation to contemplation of what God's love has revealed. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with that. We'll skip over the Song of Songs. There's like 15 minutes left. The Song of Songs basically is a super sexual uh, series of erotic poems. Um, and I included for funsies a couple of readings for you in the readings from the Song of Songs. And then Teresa of Avila, the, the Spanish mystic nun, Carmelite, who basically envisioned an angel having sex with her. Um, and then Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, one of the most famous abbots of all time, 12th century, uh, from the, the monastery of Citeaux in France. And Bernard wrote a homily about kissing Jesus on the lips. And so I want to note, like, as we've talked about, like, the many images of God that one might have, that there are people who radically depart from convention, like Teresa imagining having sex with God and Bern Bernard uh, imagining kissing Jesus on the lips. Um, that I think in part is informed by the presence of the Song of Songs in the Bible. And so for all the weirdness that is in the, the Hebrew Bible, what I have fallen in love with is its ability to shatter my preconceptions and my understandings over and over and over again. And so I simply want to ask you, um, what is something that has sparked your own imagination over the course of the past few months spending time together? And then like what questions remain? What points of confusion are there? Um, you're always welcome to email me or reach out uh, if there's anything in particular I can respond to, but um, I think it's appropriate to kind of open the floor. I think for me, the most fascinating aspect of this from the beginning is realizing how diverse all these books and where they came from and, and who chose them, you know, I mean, how how were the different Bibles and there's different versions of the Bible out there that have looked at, but um, I had no idea that how immense the historical differences are. So that was really fascinating. Those first several sessions we did. It's fascinating to me how <clears throat> many different interpretation you can get out of maybe even one sentence yeah. and uh, one book. And, uh, you know, uh, everybody looks uh, totally differently uh, with different eyes. And, you know, uh, so many people are, are right. And uh, sometimes you don't find a wrong on it. Uh, so it's just a matter of how you feel and uh, how you interpret and how you intake it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I, I think it's been so fascinating is how the ancient peoples uh, yearned for God and searched for God and, and hungered for God in their lives and um, how they were able to find ways, their own ways to, to meet God. Um, that's been very interesting. But we must not forget that the Bible was written way, way later and they basically look back 
how those ancient people looked at it. So really, when you think of it, uh, it's not really uh, history history in, the, in, in that matter of fact. It was how the writers of the Bible looked at the ancient people mm. and their beliefs. And, and how they took somebody else's story and then put the, layered their own beliefs on top of it to make a new, a new story. Or that I didn't know they did that. Like, and we're still searching today. Right. right. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sense of wonder because, you know, we, we get the New Testament and, you know, I want to say some old, old uh, Testament readings like the Psalms in our, our uh, Sunday Mass or whenever you go to Mass. But in terms of um, just knowing anything about the Old Testament, other than Genesis and a few of those little stories, I had no idea. So this has been fun for me, just a sense of wonder <clears throat> and reinforces the fact that you can hear stories again and again and again and again, but they're, they're often different depending on what your life experiences were and then what's going on in your life now. So it's, a, it's in a sense, you know, an ancient uh, stories, uh, you know, an anthology of all these stories and historical to some point, but it's also still living. I never ever thought God talked to me, you know, until I was probably in my forties, you know, I, oh, isn't that nice that those stories happened? Or I wonder how that was when, uh, gosh, God, God talked to so-and-so or paid a visitor, you know, that, that's kind of neat, but that's where my belief system was very um, teeny. I, you know, I just, you know, so this has really been fun, just kind of exploded things for me. And so a sense of awe mm -hmm. and I'm, and I'm great, grateful that I had this. Yes, thank you, Dave. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. I love how, as a teacher, you're so quiet and you just wait and wait, don't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. it comes out. Until thoughts kind of percolate to the top. Like that's. Yeah, yeah. I know. Can't do Stand that. By <laughs> I would like to say that um, what classes did for me was reaffirm my constant questioning. Um, I was a senior in high school when we were told that last Friday, if we ate meat, we were going to go to hell. <laughs> and this Friday, you're not going to go to hell but it's your choice. You can eat fish if you want. And at that <laughs> point in my life, I mean, I realized, I mean, I was only 18, but I realized at that point that um, a lot of this catechism and this BS <laughs> that was coming out was all man-made, was all by, um, white European men. I, I, didn't, I didn't actually say it that way, but it was like, they have been, because the people couldn't read, you had to believe everything they said. And I was like, okay, from here on in, I am going to question everything. And um, I have gone to a lot of Bible classes for, I don't know, three or four years, I went out to the um, grotto um to bible classes and i over the the time we, we covered almost the whole bible um and it, it, it was just amazing that you know that we were given permission to question it um and to think other thoughts and what you know the priest or the archbishop told us we should believe um 
you know, so, um, you know, and like the laws that Archbishop Sample was talking about today are, quote, man made. Hmm. So, um, it, uh, you know, when he says those kinds of things, um, uh, the hair on the back of my neck starts to stand up because it's like, <laughs> okay sure it's in the constitution um it's in your bylaws but who wrote these when did you write these oh well we fixed them in 1967 or whatever okay great um so i know this is a long answer dave but what i appreciate is that you have given me some thoughts that I've never thought before about these Old Testament books. Um, and also um, given us permission to do that, to say, to, to continue to question and get closer, you know, to God. And um, I'd like to say um, that to Margaret that, you know, I agree with you, the older that we get, um, the more experiences we have, as Mary, Mary uh, Lee also said, but um, you, you start listening to God, you start, you, when, you, when you ask him a question, instead of just saying, oh, I need a parking place, God, um, you know, you start listening to him um, talk to you, and you start seeing little things or little things that he's saying to you or that he's tells you in a dream or you know whether it's sex with god or not or sex with jesus but um so you know anyway that i could go on all night talking about it. <laughs> so i'm quitting now <laughs> uh, you know you know barbara and i agree with you uh i asked father l once the question because you know we were taught uh, as catholics as the Jesus started the church by giving uh, St. Peter the key. And uh, that was the beginning of the church. And uh, I asked Father L once, and he says, so is that really when the church started? That's when it all started. And he was just give, doing his belly laugh. He says, ha, 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 you know, three, 400 years after Jesus, you got a bunch of old men sitting down. This is the way we're going to organize. <laughs> and, yeah. and and really, uh, like you said, Barbara, and that's something I sort of uh, uh, asked uh, Father, uh, I mean, uh, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Sample today. I said, you know, we indulge ourselves in rules and regulations. And how is that going to help us develop our faith? And he didn't answer on that. And again, I think a lot of the rules and regulations of the Catholic Church are to control the people mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. but again looking back you know where some of the uh, uh, different religions interpret the bible as verbatim going through this session really shows us what you cannot take it verbatim they are stories mm -hmm. and stories were passed on you pass a story from one person to the next person to the next person to the next person it changes. So you cannot take it verbatim. And really that, uh, I think in those four sessions, uh, we have become more and more aware too, is, you know, they're stories. And we really got to uh, sort of, when I say, take out what we can get out of it. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, I'm a seeker of truth. <laughs> But is there any place to find truth? Where where is where is the source source of truth? Well, Linda, when you die, you'll probably know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell anybody. Uh, uh, yeah. That's kind of what I I think, but then. Um, how how do you trust? How do you have, you have to have something something you feel 
um, grounded by and I don't know I I'm I think that's a really difficult point in my life is who can you trust what can you trust um where is the truth yeah, you have to look within and then that changes too because you get wiser as you go mm. I mean that's a kind of a pat answer but I mean Jesus said I am the what the, the way the, the truth, way, the truth and the light. Life. But he doesn't explain what is truth. I mean, even Jesus doesn't answer that anywhere in, in the in the New Testament when they're talking about it. And I don't think the apostles ever addressed it either in 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 their writings. <clears throat> so I think it's one of those yeah. unanswered questions. When just Pilate asked him. Yeah, even and he and he answered. He said nothing. What is truth? You know. And I thank you, David. I've I've looking at the Bible with new eyes and a new way of thinking about it. And I know every version of it is different. So I hope you do this again for us. <laughs> or with us. Or with us. Yeah, hopefully we can all get together. And then you'll go, oh, oh, oh wait a minute. <laughs> this is too many. <laughs> well, I, I would like to hear David's um answer of where do you where do you um find truth and um are able then to trust mm -hmm. um man that's a really good question <clears throat> i've <laughs> tried to escape the church my entire life um for a variety of reasons um but I can't leave it because of the Eucharist. Um, like that is uh, kind of what has my heart and soul. And the older I get, the more I appreciate the monotony of liturgy. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that I can simply go and I know what's going to happen and I can... Um, Mm. yeah just dwell in the truth of the complete to use a cliche term self-sacrifice of god in flesh um <clears throat> so let, but, let me ask you this yeah so you said um the Eucharist is so important to you. You, you put up with the monotony of of the liturgy. Um, are we so selfish of people that we cannot see um, the importance of keeping the liturgy simple and sterile, or or? You know that we have to have this certain music and we and we have to kneel at this point and we can't sit until the gospel book is put down and um we can't you know at some points it was you can't touch the eucharist are those things so important and and we're just too rebellious to understand that um you're asking a weird dude um well, I, I'm interested in your perspective because I, I get I get turned off at these nitpicky rules and regulations that are coming from the archdiocese and 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 just changing changing um, the way we worship and and making it so strict and so unfriendly, but maybe maybe i'm wrong maybe i should be more obedient i don't think it's a matter of wrong i i say i'm a weird dude because here's my dirty secret i love the tridentine latin mass mm -hmm. i adore it um i have also had mass on an airport floor in bolivia um and love the down and dirty coffee table masses 
um, I'm with you. Yeah, I like I said, I love the Latin mass, but when the we can turn the liturgy into an idol um, so easily when we become obsessed with the rules and regulations, um, that's idolatry. Oh, yeah, I've, I've got to write that down. <laughs> um, yeah, it's liturgical idolatry. Um, I, I think the beautiful thing about liturgy is of whatever whatever form, be it a coffee table mass or a solemn chanted Latin mass, how does it help us to forget ourselves and to be immersed in the body of Christ, both the people around us um, and the literal body, flesh and blood of Christ? Um, and to bring it back to the Hebrew Bible, um, yeah, I think that when we really engage the Bible with no holds barred, gloves off, like bare knuckle brawling with this stuff, like it forces us to expand our imagination about who and what God is. Um, and it, it combats all the enculturation and training that we've, we've had in our Catholic education and in churches and under who knows what. Um, that's why I love about it. Like it is a liberating and deeply terrifying process too. Um, but yeah, it encourages flexibility, you know? Um, and when I get really upset over something going on in the church, like I have to remind myself like, Jesus is way bigger than that stuff. Like in the grand scheme of things, I'm gonna go look at the birthing patterns of gazelles. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, Probably standing up, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go check that out and reignite my sense of awe and wonder Mm -hmm. um yeah so i'm gonna <clears throat> i'm gonna break in here because we're a bit over our time and so mm -hmm. i want i want to i want to honor the time frame that we've established um and i simply want to say a, a great big thank you to you dave for doing what you just said you you've empowered us to take our gloves off and really wrestle with the words of scripture even those those passages that feel unapproachable, um, you've at least shown us that it is possible to approach them and see what it is they might have to say uh, to us. And so uh, the big takeaway is empowerment. Uh, you have empowered us to <clears throat> not be intimidated by scripture and um, and empowered us to know that there is extraordinary wisdom there. Even if we're not seeing it just now, we know it's there and we can, we can circle the airport for a while and try to find the runway. Um, so thank you for that. And a big thank you to the rest of you and all those who have participated in these sessions. Uh, it's, it, it's certainly been uh, rewarding for me and um, and all of us. So from me to you, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Totally. I, uh, I put my personal email in the chat. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email me. Um, I'm not going to be at De La Salle next year. Um, oh. my, uh, I need to wait out some things that the administration is doing, um, uh, that I, profoundly disagree with. Um, but my wife and I are going to open a wine shop, we think, Aura at Labora, oh. Work in Prayer, as an homage to the Cistercian monks who cultivated the Burgundian vineyards and vineyards elsewhere. So if it becomes more than a pipe dream, keep an eye out. But yeah, I'm yeah. I'm around. If y'all want to do Bible study next year or whatever. Yeah, like, with a Copa de Vino. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Gosh. 
Yeah, but thank you. It's been a lot of fun. I so rarely get to talk with adults about this stuff. Um, you know, David, there is, uh, if I can just quickly show you, a little <laughs> winery where I volunteer once a week, uh, Christopher Briggs Winery. Maybe I can take you out there sometime and yeah. introduce you to the people. When you, and you can learn a lot about wine from uh, Christopher Carl uh, Berg, who has been making the wine there. So let me know. Cool. Yeah, let, drop me an email, Egbert. I'd love that. Yep. yep. And the rest of us can take a, a field trip out there. Where <laughs> Well, absolutely. Yes, Egbert, put me on your list. Oh, Very yes. Fun. It's his second home. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, 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 actually, uh, Chris has been uh, spending the last 18 years, besides running the winery, building a castle, a European castle out of mortar and uh, rock. No. So okay. Anybody who wants to build a castle, come on out. We are on the third <laughs> floor right now. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. What a giant dork. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, giant dork? I, I'm glad you're saying dork and not jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Every nine-year-old boy's dream to have a castle one day, and here he is doing it. So uh -huh. good for him. Wow. That's neat. All right, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, right. good night.